Hannah Seawold, and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about personal development in the context of parenting, where I explore how you can find more calm, connection, and joy in parenting through the process of self-discovery and inner growth with a trauma-informed lens. In today's episode, we are talking about the most overused, misunderstood, problematic word, a phenomenon called narcissism. What is narcissism? How common is it? Types of narcissism, how to spot one, what it's like to live with a narcissistic parent or be in a relationship with one, how to manage a relationship with a narcissist and so much more. My special guest for this episode is Dr. Ramani Durvasula. She's a narcissism expert, licensed clinical psychologist, best-selling author, professor of psychology, distinguished speaker, and workplace consultant. She has authored two books, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Surviving a Relationship with a Narcissist and You Are Why You Eat, Change Your Food Attitude, Change Your Life. Her work has been featured in many media platforms, including Red Table Talk, Oxygen, Investigation Discovery, Bravo, Lifetime Movie Network, CNN, and many others. She also has a TEDx talk called Narcissism and Its Discontents. Dr. Romani has a fantastic YouTube channel. If this topic is of interest to you, you better subscribe to her YouTube channel. To learn more, visit drramani.com. For full episode show notes, additional free resources on parenting, contact info and ways to work with me, visit authenticparenting.com. As a listener of the show, you receive a 10% discount on all my coaching packages. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to know what I'm up to in my personal life, see behind the scenes of podcasting, work, get inspirational content on personal development and parenting, participate in my book giveaways, connect with me on Instagram, the only social media platform I use almost daily. If you need support during coronavirus pandemic, I continue offering my free weekly support calls for the Authentic Parenting community. I invite you to join our free Facebook group or send me an email, info at authenticparenting.com. And now please enjoy this excellent interview with Dr. Romani. Well, Dr. Romani, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, I'm excited that you're here. I just love your energy, your entire persona. It's, oh, thank you. <laughs> I've been following you for quite some time. Narcissism, are people who are acting like jerks sometimes, narcissists? What's a true narcissist and what, how to identify narcissistic personality disorder? I mean, what's the difference? There's a big difference. And I think that, that we have to be very careful. I think too many people may be using this word as a throwaway term when it has a bit more teeth to it than just somebody who's a jerk. I mean, every single one of us is a jerk from time to time. At some level of being a narcissist is the consistency of being that jerk. But what we really do look is for some specific elements. We're looking for somebody who really has inconsistent and typically very little empathy. We're also looking for things like entitlement, chronic need for validation, grandiosity, arrogance, uh, superficiality, only concerned with very sort of, well, how do I look to the world sorts of things, uh, very hypersensitive. They can't take any kind of critique or criticism. They are, and they're very prone to rage. They don't regulate things like disappointment or stress well. So as you can see, that takes in a bit more territory than being a jerk. I mean, somebody sleep deprived could be a jerk. Somebody else not had their lunch yet could be a jerk. Are all narcissists jerks? Yes. Are all jerks narcissists? No. Now, when we start talking about narcissistic personality disorder, the game changes a bit. Narcissism is a term. It's a, you could call it a, 
adjective or, you know, just, it's descriptive. Something's narcissistic. Someone's narcissistic. It, it reflects all those patterns I was talking about. And in and of itself, it's not a diagnostic term. Some people try tend to get a bit persnickety about, oh, you shouldn't be diagnosing someone. I, I've said I'm not. It would be like saying, oh, I, I just watched someone on the TV and they look friendly. You know, it's an adjective. When we elevate it to the level of narcissistic personality disorder, it's, it's a lower frequency issue. So I would say ge- generic narcissism, like really not nice, unempathic, entitled, you know, kinds of people, that number might be probably closer to like 20, 25%. But when we're talking about people with full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, those numbers are closer to one to 5%. And there's a reason for that. In order for us to quote unquote, diagnose someone with something, they not only have to have all those patterns I was telling you about, but they also have to have either what we call impairment, meaning that this pattern is causing problems for them, or we need to see what we call a subjective sense of distress, which is a fancy way of saying they're not comfortable. And here's where it get, gets interesting. When we look at a diagnosis, for example, like major depressive episode, a person who is major depressive episode is very sad, is very uncomfortable. They may be sleeping a lot. They can't concentrate. They're very uncomfortable. So there you go. They're impaired. They, they're uncomfortable. They're not doing as well. A person with narcissism and narcissistic qualities are often doing quite well. They're succeeding. They're making more money than the rest of us. They kind of just plow through life and do whatever they want. Now, there are there days they're unhappy? Absolutely, especially when things don't go their way. But it's pretty rare for them to say, you know what? Well, the fact that I'm not very empathic and entitled seems to be causing problems for me or I'm uncomfortable. And then they show up to therapy that's usually the only way we diagnose it. So it's much more lower frequency. And in fact, the way people with narcissistic personality disorder often get to therapy is because they get into trouble in some other area of their life. For example, they're having lots of relationship problems. They're having problems at work. And those problems are often a byproduct. They're very problematic behavior, but they don't see it that way. Mm. And so when they come to therapy... Do they stay with therapy? Are there any tools that they adopt that helps them? What's their attitude towards therapy? Their attitude towards therapy is not good. I mean, as you can imagine, they're arrogant mm-hmm. and they think they know better than everybody. The, the research literature in general is showing people who go into treatment for narcissistic personality disorder or narcissistic patterns, it's not very prompt. Missing. These are not patterns that are very amenable to change because it's very uncomfortable. They they don't th- first of all, they don't think there's a problem. You know, they're saying this is everybody else's fault. Everyone else has a problem. And so it's very hard to break someone from that kind of thinking. And they don't they also don't have what we call the capacity to self-reflect, meaning that they're not able to reflect on their behavior and how it affects other people. They just blame the other people or they don't take responsibility. They'll say things like, oh, those other people are just too sensitive. They just need to get to know the real me. This is just who I am. But they don't like that people don't like just simply who they are. And so what ends up happening is they're significantly more likely to drop out of therapy. Now, people who are narcissistic are 20% much more likely to drop out of therapy. So they'll often not see the therapy through. There's not much that works. They are not they're not able to create that sense of awareness of why they need to change their behavior. And so it's very, very hard. It's very hard to get them to accept an insight. And when the therapist tries to go deep with them and really try to understand sort of the root causes and the backstory, they often are very contemptuous of that and push back and say, yeah, leave me alone. You don't know what you're talking about. This is a hot, sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And they're very dismissive of the process. So it's this very difficult client population to work with. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned roots and, and, and causes. What, what's known about, about the roots and causes then? Because there was a question in, in the community. Someone said, is narcissism caused by abuse? It can be. Absolutely. And that's where it starts to get tricky. And this is where I always have to help people skirt that line between nobody, nobody out there should ever be a human punching bag for somebody else. In other words, somebody has had such a difficult life, so they take it out on you. No, you're not responsible for that abuse. You don't need to receive it. But then they'll say, I feel so bad. This person was abused and I'm walking away from them. So maybe I should just stick it out. And I'm not, that that reasoning does not, that, that doesn't make sense. 
you know, because in essence, I'm sad for them. I really am. I'm very, very sad for many narcissistic people because they really don't get to live a full life. Because remember, one of the core pieces, and I should have said that initially, probably the core piece of narcissism is a deep, deep insecurity. They're very insecure. And because they always feel insecure and threatened by the world and not good enough, as a result of that, they are always, that's why they have all these defenses, like their grandiosity and their arrogance. They don't actually, at their deepest, most primitive levels, feel like they're that great. And they don't, they, they don't have the capacity to understand that. Instead, they sort of fake it. They create a covering around their insecurity by saying, look how great I am. Look how smart I am. I shouldn't have to wait in the line. I'm a VIP, blah, blah, blah. So Going though back to this point of, yes, can it be a byproduct of trauma and abuse? You better believe it. And again, that's where it gets complicated because people say, well, if that's the case, then we shouldn't be mean to them. I don't think anybody should ever be mean to anyone else. But I do think, unfortunately, until they go and do their psychological work, their history of neglect, abuse, or trauma, that you have to set boundaries with them. Otherwise, you're simply going to be their punching bag. And so I think that it gets challenging. Now, not all narcissistic personality origins come from a place of trauma and abuse. In some cases, it's really inconsistent mirroring by a parent. The parent is distracted. They're not consistently available. It's often a byproduct of anxious attachments. So these are often, this can often happen because a parent is only inconsistency of, in, inconsistently available. But I'm going to be frank with you. I've worked with many parents who have adult children with narcissism. And these parents have been very, very, very open about how they parented their child. And they're saying, listen, this is my, I have a nightmare relationship with my adult child. Trust me, I'm willing to take responsibility. And they will do the deep dive and they'll say, listen, we were a very regular average family. There was no, no, no one split up. There was no arguing. There was no knowledge of abuse whatsoever. There was, you know, there was plenty to eat. We took vacations. I mean, they'll say it was an incredibly sort of normalized childhood. And they'll say, if anything, if anything, their main error was they almost were too, you know, too easy on them. They're like, oh, you're great at whatever you do and almost, you know, indulging them a little too much. And so there's still a lot of this that's a mystery to us. But in most cases, we can pretty consistently point it to issues in the early environment, often around inconsistent mirroring, inconsistent attachments, in some cases, trauma and abuse, but something didn't quite develop the right way. And the other thing that makes it problematic is kids often um, mirror what they see in a parent. So that could be the kind of thing where if a parent is behaving in an entitled or narcissistic manner, that that child will then say, I shouldn't have to wait in the line. I shouldn't have to do this. And they watch the parent behaving in that way and they model that behavior. Mm. Okay. So are the, then can we speak about the types of uh, narcissists? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there, first of all, narcissism is on a continuum. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, and that continuum is from very mild and these mild narcissists are more of an annoyance than they are as toxic as the more severe forms. And And these are people who tend to talk about themselves a lot, who are, you know, kind of obsessed with social media. They care too much about the the newest car, the newest bag, the newest this. They um, they don't really pay attention when other people are talking about themselves. They're not able to emotionally connect with other people. That's on the mild end, but they don't tend to do the things that are as cruel and unkind. Now, at the extreme end, we're looking at patterns of more of a malignant narcissism that looks more like what we would see in somebody who would be manip- chronically manipulative and even exploitative, really taking advantage of someone else for, for money or co- you know, coercive control where they really use sort of psychological tricks of all kinds to keep somebody under their psychological control. And in that, there there are various subtypes of narcissism. There's sort of what I call classical narcissism, which is more of a grandiose presence and where the person has that sort of grandiose, arrogant, entitled, I'm better than everybody else. You know, I shouldn't be put through the same things as everybody else kind of narcissism. There's the been, there's more of the uh, covert or vulnerable narcissists. And these are the narcissists that actually don't look like traditional narcissists. They tend to look more like victims. They always blame the world for all of their misfortune. They're always feeling like they're experiencing misfortune. They feel like life hasn't been fair to them. They can be quite exhausting, but many times people regard them with pity and may even view them as being more depressed than narcissistic. But over time, you just see that they're always angry. They're always resentful. They're always sullen. And when we talk about malignant narcissism, 
we're talking about something that's much more dangerous, like I said, more manipulative and exploitative. And then there's even communal narcissism. And communal narcissism might even be what that person who wrote you that letter was calling benevolent narcissism. These are the people who are often do-gooders. They try to, they give lots of donations to a cause. They're always volunteering. They're very involved in their church or spiritual community. All of those things are great. However, the reason they do all those things is solely for validation. It's not just because they're doing it. They don't, it's not like they'd give the donation anonymously or they'd say, oh, I don't care. I, and they, they expect special treatment and they'll get frustrated when people don't take notice of everything that they're doing. And the interesting split with this sort of communal form of narcissism, they need all this credit for all these things that they do in the world, but then they get upset because they feel like, you know, they're not only they're not getting credit, Behind closed doors, they will often be very unkind to the people around them. So people who are in these relationships with these communal narcissists will say, ay, yeah, yeah, you know, everyone in the world thinks this is the greatest guy in the world. And yet they're terrible to me behind closed doors. And then nobody believes. How can you say that? He volunteers in the religious community. He volunteers in the community. He gives so much money. He's so generous. And so that can be a very tricky form of narcissism where the people who have to deal with that person on an individual level actually suffer quite a bit. So again, there's all these different kinds and forms of narcissism. Mm. Is it true that men, uh, there's more men than women, the ratio? There really are. And, and I have to tell you, many people who are listening to this, who have written you letters to say, wait a minute, slow down, lady. My mother was my narcissist. My wife was my narcissist. And I understand that. You know, I used to say 80-20, like 80% men, 20% women. The longer I'm doing this work, I am now leaning more to like a 70-30. And in, with time, Mm -hmm. We are going to see it get, get closer to half and half because of how we socialize boys. We socialize them that emotion is weak, that they shouldn't express their emotion, that you should even have contempt for emotion. They should have contempt for emotional vulnerability. That can really foster a core of insecurity in boys. We also put a heavy achievement orientation on boys. You have to succeed. You have to be good at sport. You have to be good at school. You have to make a lot of money. So because of that, a boy who may be sort of doing something, wanting to do something different than what the society or family or culture or anyone's expecting of him may be more likely to get that sense of, I don't know, like a less um, secure attachment or consistency with their parents. Now, the attachment stuff happens in early childhood. So that's more of an issue that lies with the parents. But as a child gets older, they may notice their parent isn't as interested in them because they're not interested in what the parent wants them to be interested in. But that contempt for emotion that so sadly we raise so many boys and men with often contributes to this, this fact that narcissism is something we see more in men than women. It also tends to get socialized out of girls. So when girls do behave in that way, that's more dominant, you know, they're focused on dominance and authoritarianism. That is not how girls are typically socialized. So there's lots of social influences that push the hand that more men present as narcissistic than women. But I got to tell you, there are a lot of narcissistic women out there and they often tend to come again, from these attachment issues, inconsistent early caregiving, and also when, for example, things like privilege in a family, that those might be girls or who turn into women who believe that they're somehow more special than anyone else and should get special treatment. And trauma can also, and abuse, just like with men, can contribute to narcissistic patterns in adulthood. So there's, there's different ways to get there. I still think we're seeing more men than women, but I got to tell you that gap is narrowing. And to everyone out there who is struggling with a female narcissist. Yeah, no, I mean, I get it. I, it's a, I'd say it's a goodly chunk of what I see in my practice too. Yes. In fact, when I posted in our Facebook community, one of the men posted and said, uh, I had, you know, I have experience with two women oh, who, yeah, absolutely. who were narcissists. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I do, it is very much the case. And I have to tell you again, more I'm doing this work, the more I'm seeing it. And again, it often comes in the form of mothers who are narcissistic, but also many times in partners that are narcissistic as well. Women. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Can you speak about then, let's say living with a narcissist, let's say it's your mom or it's your dad, it's your parent. Can we look at different scenarios mm -hmm. and, um, can you describe what it's like for the person who lives with a narcissistic parent? Well, it's, it, you know, again, this is a, it, it represents likely a lifelong challenge. Narcissistic parents leave a lot of horrible legacies with their kids. If you grow up with a narcissistic parent, you often have this voice thrumming through your head. 
I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Because you really did believe as a child, if I did enough for this parent, if I was smart enough, pretty enough, whatever it is enough, that this parent, I could finally win this parent over. And it was impossible because that parent just didn't have the bandwidth to give the child what it is they needed. It's not about the child. It's about the parent. But what that can do is it can leave people often very psychologically stunted and stuck when they have a parent like that, a narcissistic parent. And I say, grow, go into adulthood. There's a couple of different vulnerabilities that can happen. You not only can become quite anxious, you might always also have problems with regulation. For example, if you have a narcissistic parent, there's a higher, higher than expected chance that you might turn to things like addiction. And that can be addiction to drugs and alcohol, food, spending, sex, any number of things. Again, trying to fill that void, trying to fill that hole, you know, that was caused, you know, caused by that kind of early kind of emotionally impoverished environment. You know, we also see that sadly, narcissistic parents can beget narcissistic, you know, adult children. Mm. But if you're still having to interact with a narcissistic parent as an adult or have to live with them, you are not only experiencing all the difficult feelings you had from a childhood spent with that kind of a parent, you now as an adult are really then struggling with, I still feel like that not enough, you know, like I'm not enough. And as an adult, they'll still do that to you. Why don't you make enough? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? There's a lot of guilt in the dynamic. And so as a child, you often thought I could win them over. And then there was a fear like, what if I don't win them over? They're a pretty rejecting person. Now, as an adult, you're still stuck in the cycle of trying to win them over. But narcissistic parents can be very, very manipulative. They, many times, a narcissistic parent will take the stance of, you owe me. You owe me for raising you. You owe me for this. You owe me for that. And that's a very easy cycle to get stuck into as though somehow you owe them something. And a lot of people find it really difficult to separate from or set a boundary with, an, with a parent when they're an adult child of a narcissist because they feel like, well, that's not what you do. Families have to stick together no matter what. And I understand that and I respect that. I understand that culturally it varies too. But the fact of the matter is when it comes down to brass tacks, if you have a narcissistic parent and you're an adult, you have every right to set a boundary with them. It doesn't necessarily mean you even need to physically get from them. But the biggest mistake I see people make is they keep trying to explain things I need you to see my point of view. And I'm thinking, mm. oh my God, are you wasting your breath? They'll never, ever see your point of view. So you will psychologically destroy yourself trying to get them to understand your point of view. So I tell people, stop. And, number, and not only stop doing that, but number two, I say, why are you so fearful of their reaction? Unless this parent in adulthood is physically abusing you, and now that's more of a legal issue that you've got to call law enforcement or get out of there. That why are you so afraid of them getting angry? I can understand why a six-year-old child would be afraid of their parents' rage. But if you're 26 or 36, your parents' rage is just the same rage it's always been. It's their bullying. It's their arrogance. It's their attempt to overpower. If you look at it as like a child having a tantrum, afraid of a three-year-old is having a tantrum in front of me, I'd be annoyed, but I wouldn't be scared. And so you've got to look at your raging, angry adult parent who's narcissistic as a tantruming three-year-old child to which you shrug your shoulders in annoyance and you walk away. But it becomes critical. You don't engage with these parents. You go, you're very emotionally neutral. You don't try to explain things to them because there's no point. And you will psychologically destroy yourself in the process of trying to do so. Mm. Interesting. You spoke about, you know, how it's different um, cross-culturally. I remember a story. I'm, I'm Armenian. My dad used to tell this story that about this, I'm, I'm assuming a narcissistic mother. I mean, he didn't say uh, it, it's a narcissistic mother, but this guilt tripping, manipulating, mm -hmm. I did everything for you and mm -hmm. this is what you mm -hmm. do for me. I mm -hmm. raised you, I gave you, I nursed you, I breastfed you for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an adult uh, child mm -hmm. uh, of a narcissistic mother. And my father says that this man eventually got so fed up one day, he took a bucket of milk, cows, milk and brought and just oh. splashed in front of the mother and said here it is take it back all you have given me is milk you know you have given me nothing so that uh, I don't remember the details of the story but when you said that I'm like yeah it's I, I remember this story very you know fr from the past I'm not sure why my dad told me that story but it's, it's true you know this I've, I've encountered many moms, especially women. Uh, when I was growing up, I have witnessed those kind of patterns. And now I wonder, hmm, were, were they narcissistic mothers? You know? 
Oh, absolutely. That, that kind mm -hmm. of manipulation. Remember, the, I understand this is not culturally what is always held mm -hmm. up. So it's, it's not my place to say, well, this is the only thing parenting is about. But mm -hmm. what parenting is about is really to create an independent, autonomous adult, not an adult that remains reliant on his or her parents. To me, that is not healthy because what it does is when you can't foster independence and autonomy in an adult, it's just not psychologically good for them. They need to be able to find their way in the world. It doesn't mean they have to move away. I understand in many cultures, it's important that children stay closer to their families of origin, but there's many people who live next door to their parents and they're autonomous and they're independent. And then there are people who live across the globe from their family and they're still entirely psychologically dependent on them. So this isn't just about geography. It's very much about how manipulative these parents are and really feel entitled. They feel entitled to their children, even when they're adults, and have no problem using the same kinds of manipulative techniques they used when they were children to keep these kids on the hook as though they gave birth to their own companion. Like, well, I gave birth to you, so you got to do whatever I say, as though they've sort of generated their own handmaid or something, which is ridiculous. And yet, that is because narcissistic individuals really view people as objects, people to do things for conveniences. They're going to view their children the same way. So if the children aren't delivering, whether that's giving them a place to live, giving them money, providing them status in their community, whatever, these are parents who regularly expect their kids to get on bended knees and say, thank you, thank you for everything you did. I'm so lucky you're my parent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. They need constant validation, which is exhausting. The idea of adulthood is that you don't have to do that. Your parents signed up to be your parent. You don't owe them anything. Well, also, you constantly have to perform and achieve and yes. uh, choose professions and, and make X amount of money and marry that type of person. Mm -hmm. Constantly, if you're living your life around catering to your narcissistic parents' needs, then you're like completely unhappy and empty. It's, it's so depressing. <laughs> well, the, well, the real legacy of the narcissistic parent is that their children never really feel like they have the luxury of exploring what it is do that does give them joy because they view it as a betrayal of the narcissistic parent. Now, what is interesting is that some people who have narcissistic parents become very rebellious. They rebel against the system and they get out. They're the ones who escape. Now, what's, what's hard is that when that child, middle in maybe middle school age or adolescence, is rebelling against that parent, mm -hmm. it's a very uncomfortable kind of a time in that relationship, as you could imagine, because that poor rebellious kid is likely being ostracized or scapegoated. And so they had to go through this very almost violent process of becoming the caterpillar that turns into the butterfly. It shouldn't be that agitated a process. And yet it is. And many times it's it's those rebellious kids of the narcissistic parents who set themselves free and get out of this, their own lives. But the problem is, even if you're a rebel, that constant playing of that tape in your head, you're not enough, you didn't do what I want, we're not proud of you, even when you're 50 years old, it's still playing for you. And so it, it is a legacy that keeps going, even for those who rebel against it. But remember, the narcissistic parent doesn't boundary between themselves and their child. They really do think that their child exists to fulfill their needs. Mm. Oh, how about when your spouse is a narcissist, when you a, are yeah. living with a narcissist, I am thinking of a particular couple and it's very frustrating in, in, in this case, it's the female who is a narcissist and this man is just suffering. Can you describe how it's like to live with a spouse, what it's like to have that kind of like a romantic, intimate relationship. Well, I mean, it's, again, I, I entire book on it. So we, I, I'm going to try to put that in a two minute answer. Um, you know, and again, in my book, should I stay or should I go surviving a relationship with the narcissist? It's all about this. It's a really, really difficult relationship situation. It mm -hmm. often has a very clear architecture to it. There's a love bombing phase where that partner is trying to win you over. And, and for some, not all narcissistic relationships have this, but many do where that initial phase is very exciting. This person is completely, completely sort of enamored of you. And it's, it's what we call the mirroring phase. What they're doing is they're learning you. They're getting, they're getting information on you. I promise you this, they're going to take that information and use it against you down the road. The love bombing phase can feel very overwhelming. It's often extravagant experiences or at least endless attention. 
you know, from somebody where you feel like, oh my gosh, they're so into me. And you may even feel overwhelmed by it. But over time, you might say, you know what, this is, I'm, I must have a problem with commitment. This person's so interested in me. Then they get into it. As soon as you let down your guard and you give in to their heavy courtship, that's when the slow phase of devaluation starts. It's as though they almost grow to have contempt for you just when you agree to be in the relationship. And the devaluation phase can last for years or even decades. And then at some point, there's the discard phase where the discard isn't just them leaving you. It could also be that they so mentally check out, it's as though you're not in a relationship anymore. So discard Discarding mean doesn't, doesn't mean they just get up and leave. It means they sort of mentally leave in some cases too. These relationships are very emotionally, again, impoverished for lack of a better word. Your, your partners will have empathy when it's convenient for them, but most not. Now, if you both care about the same thing at the same time, on that day, they may seem empathic. You're both trying to, I don't know, be trying to buy a house together, or plan a vacation. They may seem very engaged at that moment. But the minute your interests are not aligned with their interests, there's no empathy to be found anywhere. And that can be very destabilizing because you're thinking, wait a minute, they were into me, like they were seeming engaged and now they're not. And a lot of people in narcissistic marriages and relationships will say it feels like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of a situation where sometimes they're wearing their mean mask and sometimes they're wearing their nice mask. And because they wear their nice mask, maybe enough, there's a lot of people say, well, there's just enough good days to keep me in this relationship. But there's also this sense of in these relationships, you're the one who brings the narcissistic supply. And as long as you're the one bringing the narcissistic supply, telling them they're great, thank you so much, you're so wonderful, or your narcissistic supply may be things like how you look or your status, or maybe you come from a family that makes them look good or whatever it is, that as long as that's coming, you might keep them on the hook. But for narcissists, one person's narcissistic supply is never enough. So they always have to keep getting more. And that might be from extended family, that might be from people that work with that might be through social media it might even be when they stray away from their marriage and have you know whether they're emotional affairs or sexual affairs or one night stands those are other places that they get some of that validation but it's an exhausting one-sided relationship to be in and it it takes a while for some people to see it and what's interesting is a lot of people don't even call them abusive they are abusive relationships maybe not physically abusive but always psychologically abusive you your reality gets doubted you get gaslighted they'll question you. They'll say, oh, you're too sensitive. That never happened. You know, you have no right to feel that way. So, I mean, it's just a very uncomfortable relationship that over time people sort of feel like they're dying a very slow psychological death in the relationship. And if you're trying to raise kids with these people, it's really, really hard because it's not cooperative. They're on sometimes, they're not often on, they're not consistent, they're not present. And many people, when they get married, they expect they're going to have a partner who's on equal footing. That's not going to happen in these marriages. And again, just like with those parents, and not unusually, people say, I need to explain my point of view. I need them to understand. They're never going to get it. And so people will spend years or decades trying to explain themselves to their narcissistic partner and always getting nowhere. Mm, so can someone... If some would effectively manage uh, this kind of relationship uh, for for a long period of time or for the for the rest of their life, uh, I mean, I know it's exhausting, draining. Um, it's like you're against the wall. Just by hearing about it, it makes me, <laughs> you know, so so frustrated. Do do you see cases where people? sort of learn to manage them and uh, the narcissist finds different victims in different areas. You know what I mean? So you're saying, so like in a, in a marriage, you say mm -hmm. like it's always going to be like this or do they find other victims to lighten the pressure on the marriage? No, let's say it, it's a marriage, but this, uh, let's say one partner in a marriage is narcissistic and what you describe, it's this kind of relationship. It's draining, exhausting, and, and all of that, gaslighting. And and usually you said they they uh, find other victims, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Extended relatives and, and all of that. Can the partner of a narcissist learn techniques to manage that relationship just so and for how long, if if it's possible? 
Or yes, they can. You yeah. can. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Listen, yeah, I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to say yes with an asterisk. And so the reason I called my book, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Is mm-hmm. that 50% of people say 50% of go, people go. Not everyone leaves these marriages because many times they can't. They may be financially stuck in these marriages. They may have children and don't want to go through a custody battle. They may, um, there may be cultural reasons. There may be religious reasons. You know, the, the, everyone's reasons are their reasons. But at the end of the day, a lot of people don't go. So my attitude is that then you need to understand what it is you're dealing with. Because if you're going to keep doing the same thing of, oh, maybe this will get better, or maybe I'll keep explaining myself, you're you're literally, literally going to exhaust yourself. So there are techniques. And the techniques, though, are incredibly unpleasant. And those techniques include things like you really can't engage with them. I mean, you can't have deep, meaningful conversations. And I always say, you really can't talk to them about good things and you really can't talk to them about bad things to which most people are saying, well, then what's left? I'd say all the indifferent things. And so in other words, if you tell them about a wonderful thing that happened to you, maybe you got a promotion or maybe you got an award from an organization you work with, or I don't know, maybe you heard from an old teacher, you were happy. You take, you tell, you take that to the narcissist, they'll often, um, uh, I don't know, humiliate it. They'll... Uh, criticize it. They'll make. They'll mock it. They'll say, "Oh God, promotion! You're not even making one more money. They just gave you a better title." Or anyone could do that. Or I know somebody who just refinished college and got that job. So they'll find ways to diminish it. Why? Because they're insecure. They don't like the idea that you may be succeeding. You can't tell them bad things because they can't tolerate disappointment. So if you tell them the refrigerator is broken, they'll say, "What do you mean?" we don't have money. This is your fault. I'll blame you for the appliance being broken. And it's such an atrocious experience that it's just easier for you to deal with the refrigerator fixer person Mm. and not have to deal with them. So what's left to talk about? Not much. Very indifferent, nonsense stuff. Like, oh, did you see there was an accident on the highway today, so they had to close it? Or it sounds like there may be snow coming in next week. Or, Mm -hmm. oh, the neighbors cut down that big tree. Like, you really can't talk about (laughs) much. That's it, because those are really the only topics left. And this technique I'm telling you is called gray rock. Gray rock is when your responses are very flat, unemotional, unengaged. You don't share of yourself. Self, and then that way you can keep the level of conflict down. Now, people are listening and saying, well, that's not a marriage. I, I understand it's not a marriage, but with mm. a narcissist, it never is. Now, mm. I have worked with many clients who've said to me, you know what? This narcissist makes a lot of money and we live in a really nice house. In fact, we got three really nice houses and we've got five cars and we take these amazing holidays and vacations and we fly first class and we have a beach house. They have a very nice life. And they're like, I don't want to give up this nice life. And I said, I, I couldn't understand that. And so they find the workarounds. They said, okay, if this is what my life has to be, that we don't really talk about anything and all of that, mm. and they get to keep the nice life, I never judge that choice. Mm. But what I want them to understand is I don't want you to think that one day this person's going to wake up and be nice to you. And, and a lot of the ways that people rationalize, rationalize their narcissistic marriages, they'll say, no, 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 he's a great guy. He's a great guy. And I'll say, tell me. Tell me, well, or a great gal. I mean, the most recent one I talked about is a great guy. He's smart. He's attractive. He's successful. He bought me flowers our anniversary. We have a nice apartment. He bought me a nice car. I'm like, I am missing the piece there where he's nice. Where's, where's the great guy in this? You tell me great guy or great gal. I want to hear kindness, compassion, respect, empathy, reciprocity, presence, That's what I want. A presence, I mean like being present. Mm -hmm. I don't care about the rest of that. But a lot of people say, well, he's a great guy because he's smart and attractive. That's not a great guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that's, those are, those are external superficial characteristics, but people spend decades saying, I'm married to a great guy. He's so smart. He's so attractive. He's so successful. They're being Mm -hmm. treated cruelly, but they think they have a great guy. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Uh, But what if... I'm just thinking, let's say you're managing that relationship like that, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're not giving them material, basically. Right, uh, right, does it, doesn't right. that drive them crazy? Because Yes, it does. Right? Yes, it does. It drives them crazy. And what will end up happening is when you initially start going gray rock, they're going to get angry. Mm-hmm. They're going to say, oh, so really, are you too good to, they'll, they'll insult you, they'll gaslight you, too good to talk to me? Or, oh, you're in therapy now? Is someone teaching you this? Or then they're going to get bored. Because you're no longer a source of 
to apply. At this point, don't be shocked if the narcissist files for divorce. Now, it doesn't always go that way. Remember, there's a subset of narcissists, and these are often the malignant narcissists, but it can also be the covert narcissists who are very controlling. They will never file for divorce because they don't want to give away that power in the sense of, I'm not going to be the one that the world thinks broke up a family. You know, they, so they will to control the person, they'll stalk them and put trackers on their phone and trackers on their car. And where are you? What are you doing? Who are you talking to? And always going in their email, always going in their text. Those controlling ones, you know, it's at the point where if you're not doing anything where it matters that they look at these things, they will get frustrated because there's nothing there, but they will keep trying to do the controlling. It's exhausting. So anyone listening to this saying, this is not a marriage, talking about the tree across the street and the snowstorm, there is no back and forth communication like no vacation is not is worth it and i'll tell you it's a little bit it's me being tricky because after a year or two of doing this a lot of people are saying this is not even a marriage and some people might say i'm this is inauthentic i'm getting out but there's still some people who may stay in it and yes there are times that narcissists will get mad because you're not giving them supply they will say come on come on let's talk about feelings they may even say let's go to couples therapy and since most couples therapists are not trained in dealing with narcissistic relationships, when you're with a narcissist, couples therapy can often make things worse. Your couples therapist has to understand narcissism because what they're going to do is they're going to say to you, oh, but you're not talking about your feelings enough. And they're saying, you're a narcissist, you're not talking about your feelings. So now the therapist, maybe unwittingly, is putting you right in the cage with the lion. And so now you're going to express your feelings. And they're going to jump up, they're going to jump down your throat. It's like, it's a way that they want to ungray rock you, right? Mm. When my clients are put through that, I say to them, you, what you need to do, flip the table. And they say, what are your feelings? They say, oh, my feelings are good. Here we are. Look at us. We're working on our marriage. That's we're going to therapy and say, tell me how you, and they'll say, no, no, you tell me your feelings. And then you're just going to have to make up an answer. You're going to say, oh, I'm feeling okay working on our marriage. And it's a very horrible, inauthentic way to live. There's no way to have an authentic marriage with a narcissist. There's just not. That deal is not on the table. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Uh, There is a question in, in the group. Someone says, I have questioned if my husband is one or am I one or my mother? So uh, let's say this woman is questioning whether she's a narcissist. narcissist. I don't know what... And I would say you need to do the deep dive. How do you regard other people's feelings and experiences? Are you interested in them? Are you willing to hear about them and, and attempt to at least understand their position? Are you able to monitor your reaction to other people? Do you feel contempt? For intimacy? Do you feel contempt for emotions, vulnerability, and closeness? Do you feel that you're somehow entitled to special treatment and that you shouldn't have to follow rules that mm -hmm. other people have to follow? You shouldn't be held to the same standards of, of everyone else. Do you constantly need validation? You know, know yourself. And if you really are saying, yeah, this is who I am, you know, listen, if a person goes into therapy and says, listen, I've done the deep dive. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I am a very icky, narcissistic person who's only about myself. I would say probably about 25% of my practice is narcissistic clients. So I, I know this area. It's not easy. I mean, it is them always having to catch themselves and say, you know, I'm like, you've got to figure out a different way to say this. You can't just say what you want and clean up the mess later. Because a lot of times, say, this is who I am in my mind. I'll say, and you're hurting those people, which means those people have the right to walk away from you. They, why should they stand there and put up with your nonsense? Because it's just who you are. Who you are doesn't work for them. And so I have to walk these clients through this. And some of them say, okay, I need to work on this. And some of them say, I can't be bothered. You know, I, I, this is who I am. And they're like, I give up. I'm just not going to have human relationships. And I'm like, okay, that's your call. Mm. They just don't want to do the work. It's work. It's work for them. And it may not always be work that they want to do. Like I said, I get that. And, you know, and I appreciate that. I mean, it's more that if you think this is who you are, reflect on all those things I'm saying, and then ask yourself, can I, are there, am I willing to do the hard work of finding new ways to respond? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's tough. That's tough. And so if, if somebody is willing to do the work, what would you, how would you help them, guide them, suggest where they start if they start doing some self-reflection and they accept that, okay, you know, I, I want to, I, I want to change myself, let's say. 
Uh, ha have you encountered such cases that a narcissist wants to sort of work on themselves? Yeah, all the time, all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where they get stuck is that they're like, I don't really care about that other person's feelings. I'm like, you better find a way to start caring. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're very dismissive, you know, mm -hmm. and they will get very angry when things don't go their way. Um, they don't regulate their rage well at those times. And so a lot of the work is like, can we take a moment for you to reflect mm. on how that other person may have experienced your reaction? And mm. they'll get it. They're like, yeah, that must not have been very nice, but I didn't really mean it. And I said, I don't, they didn't know that. Mm. They thought you meant it which is a reasonable assumption on their part. So it's, we do that kind of work where it's like putting yourself in the other person's situation, coming up with new ways to regulate their, their strong emotions, regulating disappointment, working with things like mindfulness, staying in the moment, staying present, um, you know, learning other techniques like meditation and other outlets like exercise. I mean, we definitely do it. I'm going to be frank with you. I don't make that much progress. I mean, I'm not going to blow smoke here and say, yeah, and then one day they wake up mindful and aware and are just sweethearts. It just doesn't happen. They're always going to be difficult. My work is to make them a little less difficult. I'm like, I don't think myself or anyone else is really pushing the needle that much. Mm. May I ask how you became interested in, in this uh, work, in this specific field? I became interested in difficult people. <laughs> and they're very interested in why do they get away with everything that they get away with. Part of it was cultural. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that narcissism clusters in certain cultures. And I think a lot of it has to do with cultures that are more patriarchal, that are more authoritarian, that are more economically uh, stratified. Those are the cultures that are most vulnerable to narcissism. I'm, I'm South Asian, I'm Indian. I think Indian culture really fosters a lot of narcissistic patterns. And so part of it is something I had always witnessed. I think, all, and then part of it was, I, then I started seeing it in healthcare settings. I was doing research with populations who had um, medical illnesses and particularly HIV. And I was noticing that a subset of clients were coming in and literally terrorizing the staff. They were rude to the reception staff. They were rude to the nursing staff. They were rude to the physicians. And I'm thinking, these people aren't even getting good health care anymore because everyone can't stand them and they're walking on eggshells and they would disrupt the clinic and they were the ones almost disproportionately taking health care resources because they were so difficult to deal with. And then I start, because I'm also in clinical practice, I was seeing people come in over and over and over again talking about the same kind of relationship. And the more it became clear to me that they just have a narcissistic partner, I'd explain that to them and I was shocked that once the person got educated, that the patterns they were witnessing in their relationship were consistent with this high conflict personality style like narcissism. They're like, oh, and they said, oh, can it be changed? I said, no. And they're like, great. And it would change everything for them. Some of them would leave, some of them would stay. But once they knew it couldn't be changed, whereas most of the other therapists they work with said, well, let's take responsibility for your part, for your part. I mean, for God, and it, that was almost like blaming the victim. I'm thinking, if you just tell them what it is, then they can work with them. But most therapists won't do that. And that was a lot of the challenge there. And so part of my work is trying to do therapist education on how do we talk to people about these difficult relationships without further victimizing them. So I got into it there. And then I got, I worked with so many clients who were in narcissistic relationships. I wrote my book, Should I Stay or Should I Go? And then it then into opened and then and then the world changed. You know, the presidential election brought this in 2016, brought this word much more into the public purview. It doesn't matter what your politics are. People were talking about this word. And now it became more and more and more part of the, um, of the world. And then I started doing work and work, focusing on workplace settings, family of origin. And then, and then now most of my work is on narcissistic abuse. So it was an evolution. I think the world changed. I think social media definitely made this worse. Um, I think in what all, sense, in what all sense, the, val the validation seeking, the admiration mm. seeking. So what it meant was that the people for whom this is everything to them, they need validation all the time. Mm. They were actually finding that social media was giving it to them and rewarding them for their need for it. Mm. So they were thinking, oh, there's nothing wrong with needing validation all the time. And so they were getting it all the time and then behaving badly in those spaces and causing hurt to other people there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. So it's just something that's just made this worse. Um, but um, not everybody who posts their selfies or whatever no. become, is a narcissist, right? No, it's, it's how much it's driven by need. Like if a person mm. posts a selfie mm -hmm. and they, they really do report that they're feeling dejected because they only got five likes and their <laughs> mood significantly changes, that's a problem. Mm. 
I once received a private message via Facebook uh, from a friend that is not a very close friend um, asking me, how come you didn't like my, my, my picture? I'm like, what? She said, she asked, did you see my latest picture? I said, yes. She said, but how come you didn't like it? And she made me go and put a like days later. I would do a deeper dive with that friend and pay attention to the rest of her personality because that's not that's not healthy. Yes, she is uh, forty five and yes. and single. Yeah, see, and my point is that listen, <laughs> I'm not I'm not using the same metric for adolescents, and I got to tell you, adolescents and millennials actually use social media in healthier ways than older generations do because I think mm. that they came up with it, so they they use it as a communication tool and and they share information in a different way. But when a forty five year old woman Mm-hmm. is actually literally going through the trouble of contacting a friend who may be too busy or just doesn't care enough to, because it's not that important to like <laughs> a picture. You know, the fact is that there's a, you know, there's a core insecurity there. And again, going back to that concept of core insecurity, because it is very easy to say, oh, these narcissists, they're such bad people. Let's walk away. They're people. They're people. They're not, I know they're bad. They're not nice people. I'm not, let's say they're bad people, but they're difficult people. But they're insecure people. And when we're armed with that knowledge, and we can give ourselves permission to set the boundary and protect ourselves and be compassionate to ourselves, we can find a way to step away from these relationships in a very graceful manner, rather than getting into the mud with them and fighting with them. It's not your job to be your husband or your wife or your partners or your parents or your friend's therapist. It's not. They need to go find their own. It's, it's for all of us to be able to find ways to keep ourselves healthy. And if that means stepping away from someone and setting a boundary, that's acceptable. Mm. Uh, uh, Does it make a difference um, if, let's say, uh, it's it's, it's a couple, uh, one of them is a narcissist, and the other party, regardless of the abuse and all the torture that this person is going through, let's say one day they decide to change their behavior and start to see the insecurities, the vulnerability of this narcissist and try to dish out compassion and, and be more empathetic towards them. Will that work? Well, they're not going to, the problem is people do that, but then they expect something in return. Mm-hmm. Now they think their partner is going to be empathic to them. They're not. If you treat your partner, your narcissistic partner with empathy and compassion, mm-hmm. it'll soften them for sure. Mm-hmm. when they get disappointed or angry, they're still going to rage and they're not going to give those things back to you. So if you're willing to put money into a bank account, but that you're never allowed to withdraw it, then that's on you. Mm, good point. Ooh. Oh my gosh. So there's no, no winning with them. The, uh, not, the, not what I call authentic, healthy winning. I think you can manage it. And I worked with countless number of peop- numbers of people mm-hmm. who manage it. And they do look back sadly on their life. They say, you know, I am, I imagine what a life could have been like with a compassionate, loving partner. It would have been a very different life. And these are the very same people who sometimes had very financially comfortable lives. And then listen, Mm -hmm. can you have a broke narcissist who treats you badly? Sure. It happens all the time. But the fact is many people say, yeah, this is so sad. Like this was my life. Now, many people in narcissistic relationships who decide to stay Mm -hmm. whatever the reasons are, one thing that we work on is them cultivating other things in their life that matter to them. That might mean being a very engaged parent. That might mean developing social networks outside of the relationship, like any affinity club, like a group of people who does something you're interested in, a hiking club or something, or through your religious community, through online communities, however it is, by friendships, but having those strong social ties, because you're not going to get any healthy social interaction from your narcissistic partner. You got to get it from somewhere. So to cultivate those relationships, narcissistic people tend to try to isolate their partners or keep them away from their friends. So that's good. It's really going to often be a very difficult thing to do. If you have a job outside the relationship, workplace relationships can sometimes foster that comfort Mm. too. Finding other things that give you meaning and purpose. It may be that you devote your time and the best of yourself to a cause that matters to you. Don't expect your narcissist to be a supporter of that. In fact, they'll be annoyed that you're giving your attention to something that's not them. So I think it's you as an act of resistance developing a healthy space for yourself outside of that relationship if you decide to stay. Because that might be, and some people will say like, listen, 
uh, this marriage was nothing. It was abusive and it was awful and it was disgusting and it was ugly. However, I was able to, and they will talk about either their career or friendships or mm-hmm. what they did in their religious community. And so, you know, we all have the capacity to find meaning and purpose in the midst of suffering. And that's something I very much work with survivors of narcissistic abuse, especially those who are still stuck in their relationships, figure it out. Some people stick it out till their kids are 18. So they've got to figure out a way to white knuckle it until the day all the kids turn 18 and then they file for divorce. Mm. There's no more custody issues. That, yeah, that advice, I think, is good advice for a- any marriage or any relationship, regardless of if, you know, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. But I think it's the lifeline issue. Like if you have a healthy mm-hmm. relationship, your partner then is very much potentially integrated in the other things you do. You talk about those things you do. You have shared friendships. You don't feel like they're, you know, you don't feel like they're always tr- triangulating and trying to turn people against each other. You know, that, that's all those things are important, but in a narcissistic relationship, those things become a lifeline. They take on a life of their own. Mm. Here is a question. She says, how to recover after relationship with the narcissist, especially when you are co-parenting now, and yet they make you feel small, stupid, ugly, etc." Okay. So anytime somebody starts a sentence with makes you feel, they make mm-hmm. me feel this. You've given them too much power because it puts you in the stance of a victim. It's much better to say, I feel, I feel less than and say, okay, what? let's take a step back and figure out why does that person have that much power that you're feeling? You're, is it, if number one, that means that you believe what that ex-partner is saying is the truth. Mm. Deed, nature, all of it, everything they're saying is not truth. It's their, their twisted version of reality that suits their twisted narrative. So step one is to stop personalizing what they're saying. They put other people down. They criticize other people. They humiliate other people because it's the only way they can lift themselves up. So one of the greatest ways to disempower a narcissist is to not listen to a word they're saying. Just see it for what it is. It's the, it's the ramblings of a sad, pathetic, insecure person designed to keep you down so they can feel better. It's like them shoving their boot in your face so that you can't get up. No. You know, so when they're saying you're ugly, you're stupid, you're a terrible parent, Gray rock. You just nod. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, I guess we'll have to, we'll, we both have different perspectives on that, but that's your point of view. And then parent the kids. Co-parenting with a narcissist is one of the hardest things a person can do. It is a nightmare. It means that not only are you having to be a good parent, you're having to undo the damage of the narcissistic parent. Mm. And you're trying to keep yourself sane in the midst of this. But a lot of this has to do with you being able to understand that the narcissist reality is a twisted reality. And so when they say something terrible to you, if you can say, okay, this is a twisted person. like This would be like me walking down the street And if a person who's clearly severely mentally ill is lying in the street and then they start screaming at me something irrational, you're you're the devil, you're the devil. Am I going to stop and start to cry because I think I'm the devil? No, I'm going to say, wow, this person's really disturbed. I might get out of the situation because it's not safe, but I'm not going to spend the rest of the life thinking on my my, rest of my day thinking I'm the devil. The same Mm -hmm. thing with a narcissist. Their words are equally foolish. Now, they're making, this person is writing this note, this uh, question, her life is made miserable by this person. So that day-to-day misery-inducing, I would say for her, things that become critical are therapy with a therapist who understands narcissistic abuse as a way to learn to cope. Number two, there's numerous excellent online communities for people who are attempting to co-parent with a narcissist. And in these spaces, you start to see a thousand women have this, a thousand men have the same story. Actually, I'd say tens of thousands of women and men have your story. And now you start learning techniques and all of that. A friend, a friend of mine uh, who does work in this area, Tina Swithin, she has a, a website called onemomsbattle.com. And, mm-hmm. and it's, I always say to her, I wish you named it something different because it, it's for men too, but it's, it's all about how to divorce the narcissist. And she has some really good resources for people who are attempting to co-parent with the narcissist. Um, there's Facebook groups and they're closed groups. So they make sure they curate people in and they don't let other people come in to harass people in the group. So there are resources out there, but mm-hmm. it is a white knuckle. And the hardest, hardest, hardest thing about co-parenting with a narcissist is number one, the courts don't care mm-hmm. that your ex is a narcissist. They don't care. 
And this is going to take a toll on your children. So you're watching that toll unfold in front of you. And the best you can sometimes hope to do is damage control so that their narcissistic parent who is just trying to win. Narcissistic parents are obsessed with winning. They have to win, win, win. And they don't care the toll it takes on their children. That is a really difficult position to be in because you're always trying to protect your kids. Mm. Yeah, there was a question. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you answered two questions. Uh, I was going to ask about resources and about the child mm-hmm. who okay. is going back and forth and with the yeah. father who is a narcissist. I teach parenting and co-parenting classes. You know, I work with the divorced custody battle cases mm-hmm. and I see this a lot and and it's a sad yeah. message to give to the person who has suffered enough right and now they are sending their child they have no choice in the court like you said that they don't care but is there something we can do? Uh, I, I don't know. I think the court has to be, yeah, this, you know, I, what, what I, do you think? Are there things it, being done? Or? Uh, ish. There's, I, I put out a video, a series on my YouTube. If people want to go to my YouTube. At Dr. I love Mahi. your YouTube channel. Thank you. So yes. everyone, please tune in. Yes. I did a series with an attorney, a divorce attorney named Rebecca Zung. And Rebecca and I did a whole series on narcissistic divorces. And it was great to have the perspective from her as an attorney. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what she really shed some amazing insight into the fact she's like, the system is broken. So like every, all these people who are going into these systems think, oh, the court is going to want what's best for my children. They don't. The court doesn't want what's best for your children. It's not that they, they're going out of their way to make it be bad, but the court is about dissolving the marital contract within the purview of how the law is currently written. The laws are badly written. So this really means in all 50 states and all around the world, people have to go to the legislatures. And how, I mean, and it is almost impossible to do, right? You're basically saying, hey, you've got to judge the quality of these parents so you can make these custody decisions. The baseline decision in many states in the United States is 50-50. And if you even say the word narcissist in a courtroom, you're screwed you will get shut down and you will be viewed as the alienating and difficult parent Mm. and you might put yourself at risk. So these are broken systems. These are judges who don't get it. These are custody evaluators who don't get it. These are laws that don't allow people, even if they did get it, to get it. Because if a judge says, hey, that guy's a narcissist, I'm going to give 90% of the custody to the, to the healthy parent, that, the, the lawsuits that would come from that, that would be flabbergasting. There's, because we don't even have a consistent way to test for this, for narcissism. There's not a blood test we can do. And so it really comes down to in these situations, if you're in a co-parenting situation, you have to document everything. Late pickups not showing up on the days they're supposed to, you know, things they don't pay for. Like you have to be a detective every day of your life. And there are times maybe that that documentation, if things hit a tipping point and you have to go back to court and address these issues, that documentation's all you've got. But you can't go into court and say, this person's so difficult, he's saying mean things to me. The judge is going to say, what? But if you have documentation and when you're going through a narcissistic divorce for perpetuity, You have to save every text message, every email, every voicemail, cameras around the house. I mean, sadly, that is your life. And you have to have it all documented, printed out, ready to present to attorneys, ready to present to the court. And people think, oh my gosh, I'm telling you all these terrible things. And the the court can't do anything with that. And there are all kinds of apps out there, you know, family messenger and all of that. And sometimes the court requires families to use that. Narcissists love testing the limits and always not using it. And so it is, this is a, a, this whole idea of narcissism and the divorce and what this means for custody, the courts are a hundred years behind at this point. I mean, it is, it's, and it really would require massive, massive changes in laws at the, at each state's level. That's, that's a big undertaking. Mm, I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I, I face this almost every day in, in my work. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's really heartbreaking. And, and sometimes the narcissist parent is physically abusive, that he uses punishments and things like that. And, Mm-hmm. And, and you are to blame, right? The mother mm-hmm. to blame or the father, mm-hmm. whoever is the other party. It's, mm-hmm. it's this constant, um, constant process. But before we end, you know, I want to end on somewhat of a, not a positive note, but we talked about already people who are in relationships or co-parenting, 
But let's go to the beginning and maybe give people uh, some advice or suggestions or tips how to spot a narcissist and never get involved with them, never marry Mm -hmm. them or never date them. Or if you're dating, uh, I, I have a lot of single parents who are listening, you know, moms and dads. How can they spot from the beginning and sort of nip it in the bud and Uh, so that they don't have to go through all of this. Well, I mean, obviously they shouldn't have married this person in the first place, right? I mean, that's that's the sobering Mm, piece. And you know what? There's many judges, many judges who will sit there and look at a worrying couple and say, it is not my job to fix the fact that you guys shouldn't have chosen each other in the first Mm -hmm. place. That's not their job. And you know what? They're not entirely... But that's, that's really the stance they take, that this was somebody, like a lot of people, listen, you know, there are people out there who are like, oh, I'm 30, 30 years old. I got to get married. I got to get married. And yeah, this person has lots of flaws and they're really disrespectful, but I got to get married. I got to get married. You got, people have got to get themselves sorted out mm. to figure out like you cannot do this in a rush. That if a person is being, um, if a person is hypersensitive, you know, like they, there's even a small critique like, oh my gosh, like that's so cute. You want to go to this restaurant. It's a greasy spoon. What? What do you mean? I eat a greasy spoon. What are you trying to say? Are you trying to say I'm cheap? Is that what you, and you have, if you get that reaction, get out of the relationship. And that could happen as soon as in the first two weeks of mm-hmm. the relationship. If a person is trying to isolate you from other people, if they speak badly of other people all the time to you, guess what? They're turning around and speaking badly about you to other people too. So when they're doing that, when they're trying to divide you from other people are saying, oh, why do you have to spend so much time with your friends? Aren't you into me? No wonder you didn't have a relationship. You just always wanted to be with your friends and they're trying those tricks. That stuff shows up early. Get out. If they always need to know where you are, where are you doing, what you're doing, who you're hanging out with, what time you're going to be home, what time you're leaving work, you might think that person's attentive. No, they're controlling. Get out. So those signs show up quite regularly in the first month of a relationship. And yet a lot of people push through them in their urgency to sort of get that box checked that they're married. Mm, Great advice. Yeah. The red flags, they do show up early. They show up very early. But we are so blind that, you know, we, we, we miss them or we don't want to see them. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Tell the listener where they can find you online, how they can connect with you. Uh, I love your YouTube channel. And of course, we'll have links to everything, Dr. Mm-hmm. Romani. I would, I, I would love for people, I have a website, which is drromani.com, which is D-O-C-T-O-R-R-A-M-A-N-I.com. On that website, you can easily get linked to my YouTube and you know your Instagram and all of that. There's also lots of resources up there for people and more information. But my YouTube is a tr- treasure trove of videos and series and all kinds of stuff on these topics. And so that's at Dr. Romani, D-O-C-T-O-R-R-A-M-A-N-I. And that same handle is for my Twitter and for my Instagram and my Facebook. And we do we do Instagram lives and we do YouTube lives and you know doing a whole bunch of different things, especially now in this time of history, to get pe- information out to people virtually trying to do new series on YouTube once a month. I always have videos out at least twice a week. Sometimes we put them out five days in or seven days in a week. It depends on what we're doing in terms of series at the time. I have two books. One is called Should I Stay or Should I Go? Surviving a Relationship with a Narcissist. The other one is Don't You Know Who I Am? How to Stay Sane in an Era of Narcissism, Entitlement, and Incivility. Both of those books can be found at any online bookseller or Barnes & Noble, Amazon, anywhere. Those are also available as audiobook. They really give a very intense overview about what these patterns are about. So lots of places to get more information. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was I my really, pleasure. I really appreciate this conversation. A juicy one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 